Hello everyone. <laughs> Today we're going to talk and look at ring model population management. Um, so yeah, here are the objectives to me for this uh, lecture. Um, first we're going to analyse research techniques as a whole, looking at marine mammals um, generally, um, and look at how effective different types of uh, research techniques are. Um, then we're going to discuss selected, the selected species demographics, um, so we're going to look at things like population size, adults and juveniles, numbers. Um, then we're going to review the data that's been collected, um, see how accurate they could be, um, and how effective their estimated met uh, estimation methods are when they're estimating numbers. Uh, and then we're going to produce some conservation aid, ideally to try and promote the um, increase of the species at the end. So yeah, so research techniques. Research techniques in the marine environment are quite difficult to do. Um, it's all a forever changing environment, and it's there's no bounds. There's no like they have to live here. They can migrate in and out of certain areas. So yeah, it's quite a hard place to do any sort of research, um, especially for population. Um, one of the main ways that people do so uh, do population estimates is through surveys. So basically, it's like direct counting of individuals in an area, um, and from that, you can look at um, over air, so you can have pictures from up, up the top, or planes going across, or helicopter, or you can have in boats, or you can have um, actual site points where people do it from the land. Um, so yeah, there's different methods. There's boat survey, which can be, the negative of the boat survey is it can be quite disruptive to the, uh, to the animals, especially because they're going to be in the water, and then most of the time, it can be, Force animals to move away. <laughs> um, but with this one, um, a positive of this is that HD photographs can be taken at the time, that so less fuel can be used and less disturbance can happen um, because the photos can be taken back and then studied at a later date instead of at the time. Um, another uh, method is aerial surveying which is, as you can see in the picture, like from a helicopter in this one. Um, so this like, direct counts from above. Again, you can use pictures, but a negative of this one is that with the growing increase of wind turbines and coastal regions, it can cause difficulties trying to get lower to the ground, um, especially in planes that are flying across. Um, but one thing that they've done that sort of um, makes that better is that they've started using drones. Drones, some people see it as negative, some people see it as um, positive. They're a lot cheaper than flying an actual plane out there. Um, it's just because it's a bit of a work to start with. Uh, and they're a lot smaller, so they can dodge around things. But the issue with mm -hmm. drones, as we'll see, so this was on Tedsbury Beach in Scotland. This is with seals. This is drone footage. So, Obviously it comes across and as soon as you'll see in a sec, as soon as one of them notices it disturbs all the whole, all of them, so all of them start moving away. So it's quite, quite clear it's disturbing the animals. So even though people say yeah it's good and it's, like, uh, and it's cheaper and stuff, it's still disturbing animals, so it's almost aligned with the boat surfing technique. surgically put on trackers onto animals, which is obviously a bit more invasive. Um, uh, the trackers themselves, they get, collect a lot of data, like distribution, where they're found, migratory routes, so it gets quite a wide range of things, but, where, but trying to get population estimates from using that is quite hard, because it's like, you, obviously you can see, you can hear noises, but it's just all, again, guessing, essentially. Um, another uh, way that they can do it is through nicks and notches in their fins. So, as you can see, these are all the same species. I don't actually know what it is. But they've 
all got different notches from the uh, from their environment, from however, uh, from like coral, for example, you can, like cut them off, uh, or any interactions that they've come across. Um, a negative for the micro capture method is that it's very time consuming, uh, trying to identify hundreds of animals in, uh, it's always going to be quite time consuming. Uh, also, um, with the, the, the Nixon and notches, it can be quite subjective. So pe some people could say, oh, this is this, is this one, but other people might disagree. It can cause a bit of uh, argument at, at the end of the day, because people see different things. So, the moon whales. <laughs> Delphinatorus lucus. <laughs> the lucus whales. One of the white whale. People like to call it the white whale. Um, so, this is the transformation I've chosen. Uh, so, the distribution of the blue whale, mostly Arctic and sub Arctic regions. As you can see, they like it up there. <laughs> There's a bit of a gap east of Greenland, um, but pretty much across the whole stretch they can be found. Um, but I would look at a specific top population, which is in the Cook Inlet, which is in Alaska. Um, so yeah, so that's one of, I think globally there's 21 subpopulations. So that's a pro they're approximating around 136,000 mature adults uh, globally. That's across all subpopulations. And currently, as a whole, they are least concerned. Whereas if you look at the Cook Inlet subpopulation, they are a local subpopulation, which means they only are found there. They don't migrate in and out. They literally found there. They they think there's around 231 mature adults left, but that was the last study in 2016, uh, and their class is critically endangered purely because of the low number that they have. Um, so yeah, overall, they I think a study that there was actually a study in 2017 that said there were 328 altogether. So that's 231 adults, which means there's only about 97 juveniles in, this, in the area. <clears throat> so, their population. Uh, as a whole, their, as in the Cook Inlet, they have had population estimates from 1979. Obviously, back then, there's not as much technology as there are now, such as the drones and such. Um, but, Quite clearly, so obviously they've been doing the population estimates, but from 1994 to 1998 they had unregulated hunting by native Alaskan hunters, and that caused an increase, uh, a decrease of about 47 of the population, which there wasn't many anyway. So this is uh, the mature adults population. There wasn't many to start with, but obviously there is quite a bit. It's nearly 50 percent that have decreased in that short period of time. Um, so yeah, from the 1979 original population estimates, they reckon there's been about 75% reduction in the population as a whole in, uh, in the Cook Inlet. So, data collection. So the National Marine Fisheries Service is one of the, one of the two main organisations that do population estimates. They've been doing estimates since 1993, uh, and they've got recorded data of up to 2016. So, they've been doing annual, uh, annual aerial surveys, usually by plane, um, up until 2012. And then from 2012 to 2016, they did biannual bi 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 surveys, so obviously, that'll be two years from there. So, they are due to release a new one from 2018, but they haven't actually released it yet. So, this is the area. This might look a bit confusing, but there's the two lines. So, the red line that starts at one here, this is the where the plane would travel across the Cook Inlet. So the plane would go as a sawtooth motion to get the most uh, ground covered. But even after that, so it gets to the top and then comes back down. Even after that, they're only covering about 40%. So it's not a huge, there's still 60% essentially that is not looked at. Um, this is an example. This isn't actually in the Cook Inlet. This is just an example of an aerial photograph of beluga whales. So they say that even though that's the main method of danger use, they have to do it. There's regulations or like rules essentially they have. So the Beaufort sea scale has to be below three because otherwise, I think if it's four, there's white caps on the waves, which obviously makes it very hard to tell because they're white. Like some of these down here, like that one there, 
you wouldn't be able to tell if that's a wave or a beluga whale. Um, but the thing is with the cook in there, because it's a, a local subpopulation, they're always there. So when the low tide comes in, there are only certain areas within Cook Inlet which are deeper water, which are the only areas they can they can stay in. Because of that, it congregates the animals to those areas, so it makes it a lot easier for them to, to get these estimations and see the population as a whole. Um, yeah. So, going back to the time scale. Um, in 1998, like I said earlier, the unreg uh, well, 1994 to 1998, was the unregulated hunting, which caused a massive decrease in the, in, in the population. In 2001, the NNFS introduced a quota of six animals that can be hauled out a year. Um, and then seven years later, they banned the harvest altogether, so they weren't allowed to take the Luga wells from a specific body of water. That was the locals as well, they, they weren't allowing anyone to do that. <clears throat> oh, I didn't even notice they were coming down there. Um, yeah, so, before the unregulated hunting, they had uh, a rough estimate of about 643. So that was in 1994. Um, 1998, after that, 347. But then if we go right up to 2016, it's, it's again, it's lower, so it's still decreasing. But compared to that, it's not a huge amount. Um, it's only 20 odd animals. Obviously that's obviously not good, but it's, and it's still increasing. But from that it's shown that those uh, introduced quota and the band harvest has uh, reduced the, the, um, the decline rate. So this, this is just some pictures of the area as well. So you can see 68% uh, of the blue wells are in the grey bit and then 95% are in the, the cross bit. So this was in um, 1978 to 1979, so this is from the first recordings that they had. So then again, 1993 to 1997 reduced a lot. 98 to 2008 reduced again. So they're sort of slowly moving up towards the north, going further inland. Um, and again, 2009 to 2014, even smaller again. So yeah, so the second organisation is NOAA, or the National Oceanic, Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. So instead of using aerial counts, they did um, a satellite tagging project between 1999 and 2003. And from those animals, so there's, they were actually surgically attached, so they weren't just a suction cup. Um, but those satellites have gotten a lot of data over the time that they've been there. Um, they've recorded distribution, and through this, they've been able to, I think it's the next time. Yeah, so they've been able to produce a map of critical habitat areas. So uh, the red area is critical habitat 2, area 2, which is where most of them are going to be. This is the concentrated area in the right in the northern region, so, so critical habitat 1. So that's like the main area. And then they've got the exclusion area as well up there, which is, I've, from what I've read, I think that means that they don't do anything in that triangle. There's no protection of the animals within that triangle. So. It's supposed that they said, well, the research they've done said that that supposedly should help the population because it's a small part that's not regulated. I didn't quite understand that, uh, but that's what they've said in there. Um, so, yeah, so for my conservation aims, uh, this is the current threats that NOAA have listed on their website for the animals habitat loss, water pollution, prey items, and human noise. With Oil, currently oil rigs in the cook inlet, which are obviously drilling for oil, which causes, a lot, as you know, a lot of noise and destruction to animals that are trying to communicate or trying to uh, move around. Um, the habitat loss, like I said, the critical habitat, so NOAA have sort of covered that a little bit recently. Um, so I looked at the previous management, so 2008, harvest ban. 2011, that's when they released the critical habitat map. So they did, the, they did the survey in 1999 to 2003, and then it took them another eight years to actually release the habitat map. So that's eight years of data that they collected over time to see where the best areas to protect are. And also since 2016, they've started doing public awareness as well. So they've started this thing called the Beluga Count, where they invite local people to come down and help with counting belugas. And, um, it's just promoting the well, like the, uh, the animals and the fact that they are decreasing. 
So, the goals and objectives that I've got. Overarching goal of the, the conservation aims is to reach a point at where the species have covered enough so that it warrants removal from the IUCN red list. That would be like the overall goal of it. Um, but to start with, maybe just um, out of the critically endangered section, maybe just the endangered or, or vulnerable, that would be quite good. But overall, it would be to get them completely off the red list, obviously. So there's two objectives that I've looked at. Um, that, would, that might be beneficial. Uh, it's first is reduce human induced noise within Cook Inlet. So this is either reducing boat traffic, so obviously there's got to be boats coming in and out from the oil rigs, but also maybe only using the oil rigs at certain times of the year, depending on breeding, or depending on, uh, or only happening in certain sites where breeding, um, so like avoiding sites where breeding is. Um, that, I think, would help, since that's what Noah was saying is one of the main threats is, is noise pollution. Another uh, objective, so on the last slide I said about prey uh, and lack of prey. Uh, basically, in implementing a holistic approach to the management plan would be beneficial because instead of just concentrating on the blue that you're, uh, you're, you're concentrating on the whole environment and their prey items. So their prey items have been said to be quite low, which is mostly salmon around that area. Um, and obviously there's a lot of salmon fisheries. So by reducing those or producing quotas for salmon to help with this or close certain no-take zones within the area might be quite uh, beneficial as well. So, conclusion. Overall, I'd say that the aerial surveys are probably the most accurate way for, for this population since because they are a local subpopulation, they're not migrating very far. They're all gathered together in the low tide. So I feel like aerial surveys are probably one of the best ones to do. Um, so that even though the uh, even though there's been a lot of stuff with NOAA and the NMF, uh, uh, NM, uh, N, that's the fishery service people. <laughs> they, um, even though there's been a lot of data research and stuff, the population is still decreasing. So even though they've implemented these different measures, obviously there still needs to be some sort of research into direct calls because they just got, they put the ban in and that's still not stopped them decreasing. Um, and then obviously more regulation or a holistic approach to the management might be beneficial um, just because, like I said, the, an example of the, the holistic approach would be the California Sea Otter. Obviously when they put the abalone management plan in, that in turn then increased the, the sea otter population. So that would be a good example of, of that working for that species, so it might work again for the, for the blue ground. Thank you again,